So you all know the feeling. If you are sitting in an airplane, somebody is sneezing in your back and you feel awkward. All these germs and all these viruses in your back. You think, is it just a cold or is it a flu? Is it perhaps something more serious? Is it Ebola or SARS? We all feel awkward if you see that. We hear that sneezing distributed by the air condition. It's a strange feeling. And we think, don't we have drugs to cure these diseases and to keep us safe? Yeah, we have a lot of drugs around. We have chemists, we have scientists producing every day a lot and thousands and millions of drugs. But they don't come to the market. Why is that? So most of our drugs which are produced, they take a long time to come to the market. And what they actually do is they need to, to uh, go through a lot of different experiments such as animal testing. And we have um, three million animal testings a year, but only 46 medications can come out to the market every year. And this shows you that we don't have the medications for all the diseases for all the, the, to cure all the diseases and infectious diseases we have around nowadays. Why is that? So we also have no experiments that make the, the drugs safe for our children. Our children are the, 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 in fact, they have to be test persons for all the medications because the medications they get, this is the medication what we take, but we don't know whether they can take it. So most of the medications that come to the market undergo a lot of different experiments, and most of these experiments are done in animals. And the results from the animal testings are not always transferable to the humans. So in the clinical studies with the humans, many of the patients suffer severe side effects or the drug is not even efficient. So how is a drug um, basically designed. So we start to bring one medication to the market. We start out with 10,000 of different drug candidates. These 10,000 drug candidates end up in different experiments like in vitro studies, test tube studies, and then 250 of them come into the animal studies. The, uh, out of these 250, still 50 of these drug candidates reach the patients in the clinical studies, and only one medication is coming to the market, meaning that 49 of these drugs are having severe side effects in patients. But imagine we can replace these animal studies into something what is called the human on a chip. You have a little chip, something like this here, what I have in my hand, which is, have, which is basically homing all the very important organs of a human on a chip, then we probably might get only one drug candidate into the clinical studies, and this only one drug can also go to the market. This would be an, a nice scenario, so we can um, reduce the animal studies, and also we make our drug testing safer. How can we do that? So, usually in pharma, call, in, in pharma industries, the drugs are first tested in cells, in human cells. This is the only test what they do in humans before they reach the clinical studies. And here the cells are basically cultured in a 2D environment. Can you imagine yourself in a 2D environment? You're flat. You're not flat. You are 3D. You have a lot of different organs. They look differently. They are compartmentalized. And you face really also mechanical forces by just walking, stretching, and also you have temperature sensitive um, um, targets here. And this is making you a 2D model, not a good model, to really test the drugs. So imagine you can just switch to a 3D model. To a 3D model, we call it, we can put this on such a little chip, and this is what was done in my lab a couple of years ago. We wanted to culture all these cells in a 3D environment, making these cells feeling homey, homey as they are in an organ like a liver or a kidney or a brain. But what about the nutrients? How can the nutrients come to a 3D cell culture? And therefore, we developed 
a vasculature. So a blood vessel system, which gives all the gases, the drugs and the nutrients to the 3D environment. And we call it here the microfluidic vasculature, which is from artificial plastic. It's formed by plastic and it's actually done like a yogurt cup in your refrigerator. You see here the yogurt cup and the artificial blood vasculature and the blood vessel system, which is just tiny, tiny compared to the yogurt cup. But it works. It's a porous plastic channel system, round channel system, and this can be flooded by blood. It is produced by just heat and pressure in a channel structure. The channels are then glued in onto this little chip, and then you have your blood vessel system. You see it here in a, a diameter. And then you basically take this blood vessel system and print with a 3D printer your organs. You will say, OK, printing. Yeah, you can do that today, 3D printing. We heard a lot today already about 3D printing. And then you print organ one and organ two, organ three, like a kidney, the liver, the brain, and all the very important organ onto the vasculature blood vessel system. And then you connect this all to a blood circulation and bring all the nutrients, drugs, and everything to this little chip. So, and then, what is coming out then? So you basically take it as a patient. You monitor all the vital, the, the vital uh, factors, like, uh, for example, the blood flow, the blood pressure, all the metabolism, what is coming out of this, as you do in intensive care units in the patients. So, I told you about bioprinting, 3D printing of organs. How does that work? This is not a future anymore, it's present. You don't believe it, but it is present already. And we are facing a new era, even of making larger organs for transplantation. How does that work? You see here a drawing which was done a long time ago when the first thought of uh, bioprinting came across and physicians thought it is a good opportunity to print a 3D uh, pumping heart in a Hewlett Packard uh, printer. So when I started out doing my research, <laughs> you see here the meat from my, my refrigerator. <laughs> it's not printed on this printer, but actually most of the printer, uh, 3D printing processes they started actually with a Hewlett Packard dust jet printer. And we printed organs by just exchanging the color of the cartridges with human samples, human tissues, human cells, as you see here. So you could basically replace the toner by the cells and then print. And the only thing what you have to do is lifting basically the paper up and down to get a 3D object. So it works exactly the same. And if you want to try it at home, you can do because it is working. <laughs> So now I show you a little more sophisticated printer, which is now in the lab and is doing the same job. And you see here printing an ear, um, which you see right there. It's an ear which is uh, smaller than the normal ear. It's just uh, two centimeters uh, uh, in diameter. But you can print with such a printer in a very fast time larger objects, larger specimens, which are composed of different cells of your body. And you can even do it in the same shape as in your body. Yeah? For the organs on a chip, you can imagine if you put that on a, on a little chip, they have to be small. They are just a cubic millimeter and a little bit bigger to get all the functions of a right liver, of the brain, of the kidney. So imagine you print brains. Here you see printed neurons, printed nerve cells which are communicating to each other. You see here a printed liver, a liver which is basically also composed of gallbladders, of gall, uh, bile ducts, and you see here in green. You can do that by a printer. It's presented in 2D, but it is in real life, it is in 3D. So imagine you do it not for many organs, but just for one organ, in a one organ chip, as you see here. You see here the blood vessels, you see the blood vessels when they are just having blood and they are spreading it to the different tissues. So you see that the function here of the blood vessel to support the neurons with basically nutrients is working. 
But what we have to do now is to make it plug and play so that pharma industry can just put it into a drawer and say, okay, I keep it there for 90 days and then I find out how the patient is reacting. Yeah? So here you see first uh, attempts to make it in a, in a more plug and play version where we culture all these chips. But the most beautiful thing of that is basically it's not only the testing of drugs for the pharmaceutical industry, but it's the chip you can design for yourself. Imagine this chip is not only for pharma, but it is for you. So to keep it, basically, you see here, all these people are different. You look around here, all the people are looking different. They are genetically different. They are different in their behavior. They are different in their thoughts. They are different in their, uh, how they look. But also their, gen their genes are usually different. No? Imagine you can have a chip for yourself to test all the drugs on the market on your own chip. You basically have the one drug you need for your treatment. Yeah. You go to the doctor and say, okay, this, I need a, a medication. And the doctor says, okay, you take already aspirin and you take other drugs and uh, beta blockers or whatsoever, but you need a new drug and we, have to, we don't know whether this is comparable and compatible to each other. So you ask him and say, okay, take my chip and test it. And then you get the best medication you need. So what do you have to do for this so you can use that chip in the future? You go and take your stem cells and bring it to a, a liquid nitrogen to, to store your stem cells. You can do that from your kids when the kids are born and you get the, the umbilical cord during giving birth and then make the chip, the chip of your children for the next future and the research in personalized medicine. And I want to thank you and I hope you get the idea how to print human organs in miniaturized form on these kind of chips. Thank you.